and in controlling and remolding the minds of its citizens. The experience of China's last emperor, Puyi, was similar to this officer's. Imprisoned in the CCP's cells and seeing people killed one after another, he thought that he would die soon. In order to live, he allowed himself to be brainwashed and cooperated with the prison guards. Later, he wrote an autobiography called The First Half of My Life, which was used by the CCP as a successful example of ideological remolding. At the time of Mao Zedong's death, many Chinese shed a lot of tears in front of Mao's portrait, wondering, how can China continue without Chairman Mao? Ironically, 20 years later, now that the Communist Party has lost the legitimacy to rule the country, the CCP has spread a new round of propaganda, trying to make the people again worry, what would China do without the Communist Party? In reality, the CCP's all-pervasive political control has so deeply branded the current Chinese culture and the Chinese mindsets that even the criteria with which the Chinese people judge the CCP have the mark of the CCP, or have even come from the CCP. If, in the past, the CCP controlled people by instilling its elements into them, then the CCP has now come to harvest what it sowed, since the things instilled in people's minds have been digested and absorbed into their very cells. People think following CCP logic and put themselves in the CCP's shoes in judging right and wrong. Regarding the CCP massacre of student protesters on June 4, 1989, some people said, if I were Deng Xiaoping, I would have stopped the protest with tanks too. In the persecution of Falun Gong, some people are saying, if I were Jiang Zemin, I would eliminate Falun Gong too. About the ban on free speech, some people are saying, if I were the CCP, I would do the same. Truth and conscience have vanished, leaving only the CCP logic. This has been one of the vilest and most ruthless methods used by the CCP, true to its unscrupulous nature. As long as the moral toxins instilled by the CCP remain in people's minds, the CCP can continue to gain energy to sustain its sinful life. The question, what would China do without the CCP? This mode of thinking fits the CCP's aim of having people reason using party logic. The decades of CCP propaganda have trained people to think of the party as their mother. The omnipresent CCP politics have rendered people unable to even conceive of living without the CCP. Without Mao Zedong, China did not fall. Will China collapse without the CCP? The CCP's claim to legitimacy lies in the economic development over the past 20-some years. But, Tracing it back throughout history, the reform in Chinese rural villages in Anhui province was initiated by the peasants themselves. The reform in the cities came from requests by business leaders to loosen government restrictions. In reality, these developments were gradually achieved by the Chinese people after the fetters of the CCP were slightly relaxed, and therefore have nothing to do with the CCP's own merit. There are two supervisory systems in China. One is the administrative system, and the other is the party system. The administrative system exists to solve social problems and to facilitate the development of society. But the party system, which does not attend to its proper duties, attaches to the administrative system 
as a parasitic, evil specter, controlling the administrative system and taking credit for the achievements of people's hard work. It has become a malignant tumor growing in the Chinese society. The CCP has, however, claimed this economic development as its own achievement, asking people to be grateful for it, as if none of these developments would have taken place without the CCP. We all know, though, that many non-communist countries achieved faster rates of economic growth a long time ago. The CCP attributes anything bad to reactionary forces and the ulterior motives of certain individuals while crediting everything good to the party leadership. For example, the winners of Olympic gold medals are required to thank the party, and the party then congratulates itself as a great nation of sports. China suffered a great deal in the SARS epidemic, but the party mouthpiece, the People's Daily, reported that China defeated the virus by, quote, relying on the party's basic theory, basic line, basic principle, and basic experience." Unquote. The launch of China's spaceship, Shenzhou-5, was accomplished with the help of professionals in science and technology, but the CCP used it as evidence to prove that only the CCP could lead the Chinese people to enter the ranks of the powerful countries in the world. As for China's hosting of the 2008 Olympic Games, what was in reality an olive branch given by Western countries to encourage China to improve its human rights. The CCP uses the games to enhance its claims to legitimacy and to provide a pretext for suppressing the Chinese people. Even the wrongdoing that the CCP commits can be turned into something good to serve the party's purposes. In the early 1990s, for example, the selling of blood became popular in mainland China. The county and town government made slogans such as, if you want to be comparatively well off, just go sell your blood. Another was, selling blood is honorable. They contrived these slogans to encourage peasants to sell their blood. In the poor rural villages, sanitary conditions are very bad, and there is usually no medical examination prior to drawing the blood. As a result, Many peasants have been infected with AIDS. In Henan province alone, hundreds of AIDS-infected villages have emerged, and about one million people have been infected with HIV. But the CCP has treated the spread of AIDS as a state secret and forbids investigation. A grassroots-level official even openly said, quote, The AIDS patients are not human. They are ghosts. When they all die, the AIDS problem will be over." Unquote. When, through the great efforts of some medical workers and the international society, the truth about the rampant spread of AIDS in China could no longer be covered up, the CCP suddenly created a new identity. It carefully mobilized its propaganda machine, utilizing everyone from well-known actors to the party's general secretary, in order to falsely portray the prime culprit, the CCP, as a blessing for the patients, a destroyer of AIDS, and a challenger to disease. In dealing with such a serious life-and-death issue, all the CCP could think